Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for checking out the channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, and I want to welcome you back to Race, Ethnicity, and the Ancient Mediterranean World. Dr. Rebecca Futo-Kennedy, thank you so much for coming back on today. Happy to be here. So now we are getting to Herodotus. Ian McLean asked, Herodotus claimed that the Colchians were of Egyptian stock, that they were of dark skin and woolly hair. They weaved their clothes in the Egyptian manner and practiced circumcision. He believed they were the remnant of the European expedition by Pharaoh Sesostris. Why did Herodotus make these comments? Is there any evidence for Egyptian genes in modern Georgia? And what reason would Herodotus have for making these peculiar observations if they were completely unfounded? I'm going to summarize that right now and be like, basically what he's asking, were the Colchians African? Yeah, so I think the actual question is why this is a question. Um, really, first off, we're never going to actually find, first off, the Egyptians, of course, were African. And we have evidence from Herodotus and other sources that Africans tended to be black, that they were a range of colors that would constitute black today. Um, and they were actually, the Greek words that are used for them is black. Sometimes they don't comment on color because the Egyptians had a range of skin colors. Some Egyptians looked just like Greeks, who again, were also uh, often called black. Why? Because men, if you're a man in the Greek context, being called black skinned is a sign of masculinity and being outside and exercising in the nude in the gymnasium, the naked room, the naked place, as I often refer to the gymnasium, because that's what gymnast means. Gymnast means naked. If people don't know that. Um, so when you go to the gym, you're going to the naked place, just so you know, <laughs> the place where you should get naked. And so, so the question is, why is this a question? It's a question because of this heated debate over whether or not Egypt is, for well, us, two debates. One is, are Egyptians black in our common contemporary context? But also the other question is, are there quote unquote people of color in the ancient world? And so this is the problem that we have, right? This sort of assertion that goes back to, um, a, a, it's a very longstanding practice, but it sort of gets encapsulated for me in, the, in a quotation from the famous classicist Bernard Knox in the sort of response to the Black Athena debates. He wrote an essay, gave a talk titled, and then it became a published essay called The Oldest Dead White European Males. And he says in it that, you know, of course, the Greeks are not black. The Greeks are white, or rather, actually, they're really olive skin colored. So you see the sort of problematics of actually equating skin color with whiteness when it doesn't actually work. The Greeks are not British <laughs> um, or German. But that's the other problem is that there's been a, a lot of effort um, by scholars uh, since really, you know, Frank Snowden in his book, Blacks in Antiquity, um, to actually recognize and acknowledge that there are, in fact, Black people who are not just part of the ancient Mediterranean, but are integral to and exist in the ancient Mediterranean, in the Greek world, in the Roman world. They're, they are Roman citizens. They're Egyptians. They are members of the Egyptian hierarchies. They're pharaohs in Egypt, etc. And so that is actually often what the question is really, what's, what's hiding behind that question, is trying to show the ancient world as a white space when it is not a white space. It is a multicultural, multi-ethnic and in our modern terminology, multiracial world. And this idea that we can then go and find quote unquote Egyptian genes in Georgia is kind of funny because what does it mean to have an Egyptian gene? Well, we decide what an Egyptian gene is based on partial reconstructions from like a handful of mummies. And we decide these, we modern scientists or modern geneticists decide these are the five markers out of the 30 some billion, you know, alleles or whatever, however many millions there are, I think it's like 33 million alleles or something, that these 30 of them are going to be the ones that we decide makes them Egyptian. When Egyptian was a cultural designation, not a genetic designation. So how do we know where, where these things are going to pop up? We can't, and we can't actually use genes to make this decision. Herodotus describes a group of people called the Colchians as being black. And I would also push, I would push, not, they, he doesn't say that they have dark skin and woolly hair. He has, they have, they say have black skin and kinky hair. Using woolly hair actually is the, pretends that the word that he's using is the same word that's used for sheep and it's not. Sheep's hair is not what they, the word they use to describe people's hair. So we want to be careful. It's like tightly twisted, right? Or kinky hair, not woolly hair. And it's not dark skin, it's black. And this is a word that is used 
of Ethiopians, of Egyptians, of Odysseus, and, and others, right? Um, and it, but it codes differently in different contexts. So he's, he, it, the question is, are they of Egyptian stock? It is very likely that there was Egyptians who, for whatever reason, settled in the Black Sea. The Black Sea has hundreds of colonies that settled all along. The, the city of Miletus itself settled something like 90 colonies and trade outposts on the Black Sea, right? So obviously it's, it's possible that this is a remnant of an Egyptian exhibition that actually settled there, or they could have been mercenaries that were hired. Is this group of Colchians, the people that they're calling the Colchians here, is this the same people that the mythical Medea comes from, the Colchians? We don't know, um, because these terms are not consistently used over time. And Herodotus is one of the worst in terms of consistency of categories and consistency of terminology. Uh, because he's recording what people tell him, he isn't necessarily consistent with with what he says. And so it, one thing that is a mark of Egyptians in book two is not a mark of Egyptians in book seven, um, because he's getting a story from different angles. So yes, it's quite possible that these people were in fact Egyptian. It's quite possible that they were black skinned and that they had twisty hair, twisted hair. Um, it's also possible that they practice circumcision. We know of multiple groups in antiquity that practice circumcision, um, not just the Egyptians, obviously the Jews did, but Herodotus doesn't actually know who Jews are. And so there's some question about maybe he conflates Egyptians and Jews, um, especially since we get to later texts like Herodotus and others that say that the Jews were actually Egyptians who were driven out. So there's, there's the fact that these groups are not distinct and actually clearly able to delineate is a product of our source material. Um, but my question is, why do we want to ask this question? Do we really want to ask this question because we're trying to basically make sure that our spaces like Georgia, which is, of course, one of the spaces that um, Blumenbach targets as the epitome of whiteness, right? This is why we have the word Caucasian has made its way into our taxonomies of humans. It's because a guy named Blumenbach said, hey, the most beautiful white people in the world live in the Caucasus Mountains. They live in Georgia and the Ukraine. And so I'm going to call all white people Caucasians. That term doesn't actually have anything to do with our genetic or ethnic descent. I mean, my family, part of my family is actually from the Caucasus Mountains. So I guess I could be, I'm like, you know, a little bit Caucasian. But most people aren't. Most people are not from that region. So they, they but they use the word to stand in for whiteness as if it's a that is a scientific term. It's not a scientific term. And we cannot actually mark genetically for it. So I would ask ourselves, why do we want to ask these questions? What do we mean by something being completely unfounded? Of course it's not unfounded. <laughs> it has complete, right? It's completely founded. It's only completely unfounded if we as modern people want to make sure that our ancient Greek world and our ancient European world is devoid of black people, which is absolutely patently false. False. Um, our evidence shows it was the case. And Herodotus gets a lot of things wrong, but he does seem to actually have spoken to some real Egyptians um, for much of his information. Um, and I think this is another important thing. Things get lost in translation. And so I, I can't blame people for misinterpreting um, things oftentimes, because if you just read Herodotus, you're going to get a lot of stuff that actually is lost in translation. And then you're reading it often in an English translation, so you're at another level of remove for it. And if you're reading it in a free online Herodotus translation, that translation is probably from like 1920. And so not only is it like English language that we just don't speak anymore and it's like archaic, but it's also gonna be racially coded to what's happening where that's being written and based on the sort of context there. Um, but I think of the, one of the most famous stories from Herodotus that people used to prove that he was a liar, right? Which is the giant gold digging ants of India, right? Everyone's like, oh, this is totally made up. There are no such things as ants. Well, the Greek word for ants is like myrmex, right? Uh, it's where the, the, the myrmidons, who are the people who follow Achilles, um, they're, they're named from ants, right? So myrmex. Well, guess what India does have? So, so he probably heard a story that traveled down the sort of earliest iterations of the Silk Road by talking to Persian merchants and other people. He probably heard a story about how you can collect gold dust in India by scraping it off of these animals. Well, there's a word in Persian, marmex which is really super close to the Greek word myrmex. But marmex is the Greek word, is the Persian word for a, um, uh, what are they called? Prairie dogs, right? So prairie dogs are probably, and they dig holes and they have little mounds and they live underground. They do all the things that Herodotus' ants do. 
And then they, but they're big, right? And they come out of the ground and then you can capture them and then you can scrape the gold dust off their fur. So how much of this misunderstanding of what Herodotus said has to actually do with the fact that there's multiple languages that are being cycled through as in the process of telling this story. It's like a game of telephone. Right. Remember that game you play in like elementary school or whatever, where everybody like whispers something in an ear and then you see how it changes as it goes down the road. And the further it moves along the chain, the worse the distortions and the garbling get. Right. I think that happens a lot. And I think people put too much weight of evidence on a single passage or a single line or a single word in a text, especially when you're reading it in translation. But even when you're reading it in Greek, this has been a long, hard process with professional um, classicists and philologists who want to get down into that micro word, but you got to take that word, you got to put it into the bigger context, and then you have to put the whole thing into its context of transmission. And then more importantly, um, you have to put it in the context of archaeological and material evidence that goes along with it. So I think that's a lot of what happens. And I think there's too much weight put on genetics that it actually can't do the work and carry the load that people want it to carry in terms of crafting identities. But to me, the big question is the question we always want to ask and the question that I think people should ask themselves is why do I need this identity to be rooted in antiquity? Why do I need this identity to go back to the Greeks? Why do I need these people to be like me? And why do I need these people to not be like me? And if you can answer that question, if the question is, um, you know, because my identity is rooted in my whiteness, then that's actually a problem, your problem, not an ancient problem. And it's, you're not gonna find your answers in antiquity. Whiteness was not something that the ancient Greeks or Romans or Egyptians or Chinese or Persians or India, that they actually built their identities around. Whiteness in the Greek context explicitly is for inferior people. It's for women, it's for people with diseases, and it is, for those crazy barbarians who wear pants in the north, who get burned by the cold. Um, pants are not a good thing in antiquity, just so you know. The Greeks hated pants. And I have actually said this before, and I, I stand by it, that Alexander's conquest of Asia was a vigorously enforced anti-pants policy. <laughs> and anyone who says that Thermopylae was the sort of deciding battle of quote-unquote Western civilization because they stopped the Persians, no, the Persians won. We all wear pants. Um, so, so I, I would just say, you know, I think that I don't think necessarily that people are asking these questions or people do ask these questions because they're racially motivated. There's obviously going to be people who are part of that discourse and who are really super invested in that identity. But I think what happens is that these questions get mainstreamed and they get sort of um, washed and cleaned up and, and they actually just become points of consideration like, well, Herodotus says this thing. Why would he say this thing? Um, and I think that's just, it happens because those are the questions that other people are asking, but I think we should ask other people what their motivation is for asking that, for, for making that the center point. Like if I go into a, a, a group chat or if I go into a Twitter feed or something, and this is the question that's being debated, um, my question is why are we posing this question to begin with? Um, and if you start from there, um, then I think you can actually get back at the, 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 the people who started these questions, which are not necessarily questions you, you want to get caught up in, um, but also, I think importantly is that they're not the interesting questions. Um, you know, are the Colchians black? Why is that an interesting question? Actually, um, my question really is why does the why does Herodotus feel like it's so important to document all of these different peoples and cultures and groups? And why is it that he sp picks these specific identity markers um, is actually part of the big picture of how Herodotus does ethnography. It's not why this specific group and, and what does that mean for our modern um, way of viewing them, but it actually is. So why are these the things that are important for, for him to ask? And how have we then taken those things and turned them into something else? So, so, so one of the things I also want to say here is that just be, it's not to say that this, the question that people might ask has its roots in racism isn't to say that the person asking the question is racist. It's actually to say that we should question why these are our questions. <laughs> and what the history of, of our, our reception of Herodotus and specifically our reception of Africanness and Blackness is that would make this be part of the everyday conversation in groups that are interested in Herodotus and in antiquity. Yeah, it